Salutations dear viewers, this is George from Ireland and I'm uh, continuing debunking the Irish oppression myth. So I'm looking now at the uh, 1790s um, when we were a sister kingdom of Great Britain, we had our own parliament at Dublin and um, so forth. There was a viceroy um, who was usually English uh, living in Dublin, represented the King of Ireland because the King of Ireland was always in Great Britain. Um, so uh, let me see. The Catholic majority with the right to vote from Parliament uh, only from 1793 but obviously there's a property qualification in those days so most people of any religious denomination were not permitted to vote. We had quite a wide degree of freedom of expression. Then the Napoleonic Wars broke out and um, some freedom of expression was somewhat curtailed lest it be seditious. There was the French Revolution and um, some people in Ireland looked at what was happening in France and wished to replicate that in Ireland. And there were some advances for, for, for liberty in France. Admittedly, France was coming from a, a lower base because it had been almost a, an absolute monarchy prior to 1789. So the United Irishman was founded in 1793 with the objective of getting rid of religious discrimination. It's a, an honourable objective. Had the United Irishman succeeded, things might have been better, might have been worse, not sure. Uh, had, would have a lot to do with how the French came along. That's the thing is, if, if you're starting a revolution, you're pretty, pretty, pretty sure you're going to succeed and that it's going to turn out better. You might have bloody anarchy for decades. Um, even when tyrannical regimes have been overthrown, it sometimes made things worse. Not the situation in Ireland in the 1790s was as bad as being tyrannical. So most of us were tenant farmers. Um, anyway, uh, I pointed out they're mostly bourgeois, aristocratic Protestants from the East Coast who founded this. Uh, well, um, now France had invaded many other countries, occupied much of northern Italy, the French government was more or less at war against the Catholic Church, executing a lot of priests, bringing their own religion, the cult of the supreme being, imprisoning the Pope. So um, in Ireland, though we were run by a Protestant minority, uh, we Catholics had far more liberty than we had anywhere under French control. And um, Maynooth was founded, that's a college for training priests, funded not just by the Irish government, by our taxpayers, but also by Great Britain. So it's, it's hard to sustain the argument that the government was viciously anti-Catholic, that there was some anti-Catholic sentiment around. As about this time, 1795, the Orange Order was founded at Loch Gaul. Now, there's some dispute about exactly when and where it was founded, and uh, so that was that. Um, anyway, 1798, there was an uprising in, in the East um, that June, um, because a French invasion had been anticipated. It was supposed to come in 1796, landing at Bantry Bay, but um, ferocious storms kept them from landing. They got to near Ahabeg, just uh, north of Castletown Bear, and Theobald Wolfe Tone said, England has not had such an escape since the Armada, because he and his French friends were so close to the coast. Um, so the United Irishmen said they, had, they wanted democracy, a word and a concept that was almost forgotten at the time. The idea that every man had the vote was considered crazy by most people. I hadn't even heard of it. You can forget about women having a vote back then. Nobody in Ireland advocated that, so far as I know. The French briefly experimented with it. But anyway, so the rebellion started by stopping mail coaches, as in horse-drawn carriages delivering letters, because that was the means of communication. It was almost a century before the radio, and a lot of people were dragged out of the coaches and killed. Um, just civilians. So the United Irishmen weren't very disciplined. It became a jacquerie, just any ordinary farmer attacking people. The United Irishmen was supposed to be non-sectarian, and they did have people of all religious denominations, but it pretty soon descended into a sectarian pogrom uh, in Wexford. Uh, now, not all the Catholic United Irishmen were anti-Protestant, let's be fair, um, and the conduct of the Crown forces was, was sometimes disgraceful, sometimes deliberately killing civilians, or a lot of suspected United Irishmen had been arrested in the run-up to this, and at Dunlav and Green, um, the uh, British Army, because there were some British soldiers in Ireland, thought that these United Irish prisoners might be rescued by the rebels, so they were simply killed without trial. Um, and to, to get information out of suspects, people were semi-strangled, as in not to kill them, but just to terrify them and cause them pain, and then they would fess up. Now, torture was, was very widely used, used in most countries, probably all countries at the time. So it might, might seem shocking. The thing is, put your politics aside. You might sympathise with, with the United Irishmen, and they had some noble objectives. 
But if you're trying to defeat an insurrection, you need inside information, and how are you going to get that? They had no listening devices, no CCTV, um, and also other sorts of evidence. You had no fingerprint evidence even. You had to have testimony. You had to have people telling you things, uh, which is why torture was so widely used. Um, there were no international conventions against torture in those days. Um, anyway, so Battle of Vinegar Hill, the rebels were defeated. And there was also a rebellion in County Down. It's almost like two separate rebellions, like a Catholic one in the south, well, not exclusively Catholic, and mainly a Protestant one in the north, the Battle of Ballinahinch and St. Field, and eventually that was defeated, and uh, the Doyens were executed up there uh, around Belfast. And then the French finally landed rather too late in Mayo with General Lazare Usch. And there was the Battle of Castle Bar, the Castle Bar races, because the Crown forces ran so quickly. The Crown forces also consisted of militia, that's ordinary men who volunteered, they were part time soldiers, um, they had their muskets, and uh, indeed there were yeomen, and yeomen were middle classes and they had to own a horse. Um, so that was that. So people of all religious denominations volunteered to defend the Crown of Ireland. A lot of nationalists do not like to be reminded of this, but Daniel O'Connell was one of them, a Catholic barrister who's later to lead the Catholic Association and the Repeal Association, um, because he was horrified by revolutions, by France's attack on Catholicism and so forth. So um, the, the French army and some of those Mayo rebels, they got to the middle of Ireland, they defeated a battle of muck, many of them executed, some brought to Dublin, executed, at Croppy's Acre, buried there, a mass grave, just beside Collins Barracks. They're known as Croppies because they had their hair cut very short, and loyalists sometimes referred to Catholics in general as, as Croppies uh, for the next two centuries. Um, they'd often forgotten the origin of the term. So that was that. We know Theobald Wolf Tone was put on trial, sentenced to death, wanted to be shot as a soldier, cut his own throat, and before which he'd given a very truculent and stirring oration from the dock. He was a barrister himself, so quite a wordsmith. Um, anyway, well, the Catholics amongst us, presumably, we must honour the word of our prelates. And um, Archbishop Troy denounced this rebellion, no, we must not do this. There are Presbyterians amongst the United Irishmen as well, and their um, assembly passed uh, resolutions censuring the rebellion and so forth. So about 20,000 people died, and fat chance of bringing about denominational unity had precisely the opposite effect. Um, so that was that. Um, now, there was a lot wrong with the Ireland, but the United Irishmen, did they have any legitimacy? Well, obviously conspiracies cannot go around asking for public support. Um, uh, so that was that, yeah, and a lot of people put to death afterwards because, yes, it's true they had committed treason against the Crown, and you may say, well, the Crown didn't command their loyalty, it was a foreign Crown and all the rest of it. Uh, so. What, what, what's the next step? Well, they, uh, ironically, it really backfired in the United Irishman because it led to the Act of Union. Um, what's his name? Wolf Turner said, break the connection with England. Well, what he did was actually to make the connection with England. Another thing about the Orange Order, and this is more myth-busting, uh, is they were loyal to the Crown, being Protestant, blah, blah, blah. They want to defend the Union. Then the Act of Union was proposed in 1800, um, and the, the Orange Order was against it. Um, so they wanted the Kingdom of Ireland to continue, and the Orange Order was only open to members of the Church of Ireland, not to Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and so forth. Um, anyway, the, uh, the, the Parliament first of all voted against the Act of Union, second time voted for it, then it kicked it in the 1st of January, um, 1801. Now, um, Gladstone later said the Act of Union was passed by corruption of the grossest character. Well, um, what we consider corruption would not have been regarded as corruption at the time. Politicians were entitled to hand out money to get people to vote one, one, one way or the other. And so was the government. That was no secret. And uh, that was not against the law. And a lot of baubles were handed out. These gongs are like knighthoods and peerages. And people saying, oh, that's because they voted for the Act of Union. But a lot of them would have been handed out anyway because people have been fighting against the United Irishmen or fighting against the French elsewhere. But what if, what if the United Irishmen had succeeded um, and had it, we'd had an Irish Republic, it might have been better. Difficult to have democracy when we, we hadn't had it before, to go straight from a semi-oligarchy to full democracy. Most people couldn't read and write when we didn't have a common language. Some people only spoke Irish, some people only spoke English, some were bilingual. No country in the world was democratic at the time, as we understand it now. 
Um, notably, the French, when they, they printed their pro-revolutionary uh, leaflets in Mayo, they printed them in um, English and French, not in Irish. And they did use the words democratic republic, but obviously France was being run more by it was a dictatorship, having state terror guillotining suspects on the flimsiest of evidence. Um, but we probably would have ended up being a satrapy of France. Um, Napoleon had not quite become military dictator then, but he had a habit of putting his siblings on the thrones of Europe. And so he would like us to be one of the satellites. Might have turned out better for us, it's difficult to know. Now people of a Republican mindset tend to be deeply emotionally involved with the United Irishman. And people have got to get out of this childishness as assuming just because they identify with the side, people on that side were all valiant and they're morally upstanding and so on. Um, so we, we've got to say to some extent a plague on both your houses and, and, and speculate what would have happened, try and come to some reasonable prognostication and not try and be certain that it would all pan out beautifully or indeed that it would have been cacocratic.